Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know from experience that uh, you have met uh, new people, you have met old acquaintances, and uh, you have empty stomachs, and I very much apologize for that. Uh, we have been in this sense, overwhelmed by the attendance. We thought that the first time after uh, COVID, uh, people wouldn't come because they were still afraid of the crowds. But apparently, you are the brave ones. Uh, you're not afraid, and sorry, that's why we didn't have enough food. I also apologize a bit for the setting here, which is very formal. The idea of the academic lecture was uh, to take the time to go more in-depth uh, in uh, a specific issue concerning the, the future of Europe and to do it in a more informal surroundings also. Uh, but we couldn't bring you all back up uh, to these nice rooms with sun. So that's why we're here underground and, uh, and we look here on <laughs> seeing somewhat far distance and very highly elevated, uh, which we are not. Uh, so, uh, I hope you can uh, look through the, the formality. The idea is very simple. Um, uh, we have first uh, Jan Zielonka, whom I won't introduce a second time, and I think whoever has the stamina to stay with us will know him and his work. And uh, he will speak first, uh, what was the exact title? The lost future, right? Lost I remember future. something. Uh, we'll see later whether we can regain it. Um, I think that reminds me of what Stevie said yesterday uh, about the, the past, the medieval past of Seps, um, when he said we were brave uh, because we didn't know what was going to come. And uh, in retrospect, I must admit I was around then we didn't know what was going to come. And all the positives and now in this year negative aspects. And uh, therefore, until at least if we take the last 40 years, we didn't lose the future. I hope you, you agree with that. And we'll see, Jan, whether we can still uh, lose it uh, from now on. The floor is yours. And uh, then we have some first comments uh, uh, from Eric. And I very much hope that uh, you will also contribute uh, with your comments and questions to the debate. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I used to work for think tanks in my life, and these were the, the nicest periods. But uh, I had to make a living, and therefore, uh, study university all the time. Um, now you know what the last thing thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I know everything about fundraising and attracting attentions of politicians, which is never easy. But, um, but today we will have a different topic. Uh, um, I wrote it during COVID, you know, we were all locked down and I started to read different books than usually. And this is where we are. You know, we, we heard here yesterday from our colleague from Bertelsmann, Butters, Stiftung, saying that 90% of Europeans feel anxious these days. But it's not just because of the war. You know, in, in 2017, the Pew Foundation found out that in France, only 9% of people think that their children would be better off than they are. And 71% believe that they will be worse off. There is a problem. Other countries, the statistics, statistics was not any better. And we know why. We went through this series of, of, of crises, you know, financial, migratory, health, environmental, and look, not only we were unable to prevent those crises, but I'm not sure really we have really solved them, unless you believe that our deal with people like Erdogan, the 
will end migration or that the debt crisis just kind of evaporates. And we blame populism, capitalism, neoliberalism, globalization, post-truth. In this conference, we blame Russians and Chinese a lot too, yeah? But what if democracy doesn't work? Because the same problems you can observe in America. What if this democracy is not not up to the challenge. Now, I have to make one disclaimer. I'm not secretly paid by Confucius Institute, yeah? <laughs> I spent all of my life struggling for democracy and bef before the fall of the Berlin War, or rather in peculiar circumstances, so trust me. But you don't need to, you know, to listen to Chinese. Look at our own Eurobarometer. Last year, in this, in this uh, survey, 60% of Europeans declared that they tend not to trust the uh, democratically elected government. And in another survey, when people were asked whether they would agree to replace half of the seats in parliament by artificial intelligence, the young people said, yeah. <laughs> so we've got a problem, yeah? In my previous book, I argued more conventionally, pointing to dysfunctional representation, liberal oligarchy, partocracy, external veto players. But in this one, when I started to read other books, I came with different hypotheses. I basically came to the conclusion that democracy is ever more myopic, short-sighted, in terms of time and space. In, term, in terms of space, because its location is nation state, with its borders, so states, democracy within the states is supposed to defend selfish interests of a given territory and community. In, term of in terms of time, because it is it's hostage to the present day voters with detrimental implications for the future. You know, politicians always say, yeah, yeah, we are for young people, for future generations, for and this explains why politics stumbles in this ever more interdependent global environment running at ever faster pace. In other words, politics, time and space are out of sync. And the major factor here is the internet revolution. You know, and you talk about this during the conference. Digital technology compressed time and space to the degree we don't know from history. It produced flat world, as they say it, with porous borders, high-speed society, instantaneous communication, connectivity wars, the rise of market states, the rise of networks, cascading pluralization and hybridization, and complexity boarding on how cows. We all know that. However, democracy never took notice. Democratic institutions still rely on time-consuming deliberation, negotiation, adjudication, and citizens' participation takes time. And most of the, this is confined to national borders. As I said yesterday, at the EU decision-making table, there are 27 sovereignties. Some hard, some soft, but they all are supposed to defend their national interest. And so we came to the situation that we have ever greater array of technological means to deal with problems, but somehow we don't deliver. 
rising inequalities generate competing egoism. Markets are no longer under democratic control and they manage to impose a ceaseless 24 seven economy upon us, which basically ignores all notions of social contract. Democracy rewards high and hype and spin with accidental short fixes. We have basically, as my a colleague from London uh, uh, showed, uh, a, a government by decree for at least a decade in Europe running on WhatsApp. Hmm? And democracy looks back rather than into the future. We have now any, you know, our governments are engaged in history wars time and again instead of safeguarding our future. There is a problem here. And some of my colleagues entertain apocalyptic visions, but I call it absurdistan. I call it absurdistan which basically means that destruction comes gradually by default, largely by disguise. States are visibly in charge, but they are failing to solve major problems. Democracy is formally in place, but it hardly generates legitimacy for political leaders. Stock markets are going up, but inequalities and poverty are growing. Populist politicians pretend to act as statesmen and liberal politicians pretend to listen to the people. Employers pretend to pay a decent pay and employees pretend to work. International organizations engage in multiple projects, make reassuring declarations. How many headline guns we had, for instance, in, on climate? but climate change continues, migration grows, violent conflicts progressed, and citizens are cynical, atomized, and unable to form a common front concerning anything constructive. There is a problem here. There is no big tsunami But we even when we go to elections, it is not that we, we, we want to pretend the others to win. We don't even trust that if ours will win, things will be better. We just believe that th when the others will win, it will be much worse. And we tried various things to address those problems with little results, I'm afraid, or perverse results. No, we tried to empower transnational institutions such as the European Union. But this somehow failed to end the virtual monopoly of nation states on decisions and resources. Look, most decisions these days are taken in the council, which is member states. Gone is the era of strong commission by Jacques Delors. I'm old enough to remember there was stronger commission than today. Parliament got more power, but it's still unable to punch its weight, and the latest scandals make things even worse. And what is the worst is that European integration was supposed to get rid of ghosts of nationalism. And we have the rise of nationalism, the greatest in my life, and I'm so young. I'm not so young. There is a problem. We try to decentralize power and involve in the NGOs in decisions, but NGOs try to defend the constitutions and so on and so on. And you know, and this decentralization is increasingly viewed by states as a recipe for chaos and state failure. We try to create institutions responsible for safeguarding the future such as the Committee for the Future uh, uh, in Finland, or the Oudbotsman in Hungary for the future generations. But they were never taken seriously by politicians. We tried to delegate powers 
to non-majoritarian institutions with the hope that to reduce voters' selfishness and uh, members of parliament's sort of short-sightedness. Con we gave those powers to constitutional courts, central banks, European Commission, but they caused revolt, populist revolt because populists were claiming citizens, sovereigns were deprived of powers. We, we, they, they are no longer express their voice. They can change the government, they cannot change policies. So this is where we are. Had I had a perfect solution, I would immediately sell you. I, I believe that putting your fingers on certain things is important already. And in, if you are liberal, like myself, you believe that politics is about bargaining. It's not that there is one ideal model to fix things. We have to deliberate, argue, and come to common decisions, possibly. But I think that if you cannot go back with technological development and globalization, you have to kind of adjust the way democracy functions. And somehow empower actors who benefited from these digital revolutions in the first place. And if you look at the literature already, 30 years ago, Manuel Castells wrote, the winners of digitalizations are networks. Why? Because they are more informal, less structured, speedy, and able to move through environment which exactly is more interdependent and running at a high speed. And in fact, if you look at those, starting with the bad guys like mafia organization <laughs> and ending with the good guys like I consider uh, cities or NGOs, or trade unions, I believe that they already make enormous contribution to our life without having formal powers. So there is, in my view, if you are not revolutionary, you know, and I just try to destroy all of this, or wait, or a Marxist who wait for capitalists to collapse because its own contradictions, then you propose to adjust the system by exactly giving those networks which make positive contribution more access to decision is decisions and resources. And as Anne-Marie Slaughter rightly argued, European Union is one of those networks. It doesn't act as traditional state. The other organizations I know, International Labour Organization, works also, there are three parties. There are states, there are employers and employees. And this is how they move forward. World Head Organization too. Cities, I don't believe like, uh, uh, like Benjamin Barber, Barber that, that mayors would run the world better than prime ministers. I know some prime ministers uh, who were mayors like uh, Matteo Renzi or Boris Johnson. Thank you very much. But they already make contributions, you know, they are enormous. And of course, there are strong cities and failed cities. Like there are strong states and failed states. That is not the problem. The problem is that they act differently. And I believe that, that you know, that we can do something here. And yesterday I was talking, for instance, in the EU, instead of entertaining second chamber idea composed of national parliamentarians, I would simply give to those actors seats there. So at the end of the day, and I finish here, I don't want to get away with states. This idea about withering of states is dead in my view. But I want them to share power. And in fact, I see that those states which are able to share power with other actors are much more efficient. I don't want to abolish 
democracy based on parliamentary representation, but I want democracy also to be more based on the principle of participation, deliberation, and contestation. These are also democratic pillars, you know. And I don't call for revolution, but I want to encourage more experimentation. At the European and municipal level, I see much more experimentation than in the traditional forms of democracy. <laughs> and of course, experiments can fail. But I rather fail than sit on the bench and complain. You know, the idea that we can do nothing is not good enough because the climate change, financial markets, uh, and, uh, and wars will continue with our ever reduced capacity to deal with them having legitimacy from our own people behind. That's my problem. But if you have better idea how to deal with this, you have now the chance. And I have some flyers of the book if you want. Uh, some. So, Jan, thank you so much. Um, this is really a great privilege to talk about this book and also to continue the conversation that we've been having since 2006 uh, with your, with your neo-medievalist interpretation of European integration. And I would encourage all of you uh, to, to read the books that go in between, including Is the EU Doomed? I, I guess, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the conservative to your radical, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to defend a fairly traditional notion of democracy. Um, and, and, and I'm going to start with your initial premise, um, which is the idea that the reason that we have lost control over time and space is some technological innovation. It's the internet. And I'm not going to deny that the internet makes things faster in some respects and connects us across greater distances. But I'm just going to ask as a thought experiment, could we experience the same level of democratic dysfunction, political violence, populism, disorder, both in economic terms and in straight political terms, without the internet? And I think the answer is, yeah, we call it the 1970s. And, and, and living in the 1970s, we experienced actually much more political violence in our countries than we have now. And, and, and living in Italy, I can say, the level of political violence was alarming. And we don't see any of that in the current situation. And I'm grateful. So something has improved rather than got worse along the way. And, and, and if we could experience that level of democratic dysfunction without the internet, then do we need to reach for this collapsing of time and space that the internet provides in order to diagnose the problem? Or could we look somewhere else for an explanation that's a little bit simpler? One of the, one of the places that we might look is our ability or the ability of our political institutions to process the demands that are placed on them. Just like any other machine, you put a bunch of stuff in at one end and you expect to get stuff out of the other, has the machine become overloaded in terms of the demands that are being placed on it? Now, for those of you who are political scientists, you'll know that this is the civic culture argument by Gabriel Almond and Sidney Verba, where they argued that in order for democracy adequately to function, everybody has to believe that they're part of it, that they're represented by it, and that they can influence its outcomes without ever actually exercising that power. Because if they all try to influence the outcomes of democracy, then the democratic system will become overloaded and break down, and we will not get any of us any of the things that we want. And, and I would suggest there we might have a good argument to make about the role of technology, because it's made it so much easier for people to try to connect with politics, to try to influence government, 
And in that sense, it's overloaded the machine by breaking this civic culture and replacing it with a culture that demands active responsiveness from political institutions that were never designed to respond in that way. As a matter of fact, our political institutions are designed to respond only by dint of intermediates. This is true particularly in Europe. In the United States, our democratic institutions were actually constructed to prevent the emergence of intermediates, and they failed miserably. For those of you who are curious why we have the Electoral College in the United States, it was to prevent the rise of political parties, right? In Europe, they started with political parties and then introduced democracy. And democracy exists because political parties solve the one choice, many outcomes conundrum for the voters. You go and vote, you vote for a party, you have one choice, but you get many outcomes. You get economic policy, you get security policy, you get social policy, you get all the rest. If the political party doesn't exist to resolve that one choice, many outcome dilemma, then you have to express many more choices. There was a time when political parties actually ad functioned adequately because of their ideologies at helping us better to anticipate the many outcomes we would receive out of the one choice we made. That broke down in the 1950s and 60s, which is why we had the disorder of the 1970s. I would argue that the collapse of political parties is even more pronounced today. And our ability to use political parties or to rely on these intermediates is no longer adequate. And our constitutional arrangements cannot function without that insulation between the voter and the state. Now, having said that, I, I agree with you completely that what's happening is people are trying to reimagine that connection, these sovereigntists, the 27 of whom come into the council. And these people, and they're reimagining, take this notion of sovereignty and say, okay, we're going to reassert sovereignty. But what do they mean? They actually mean very different things depending on whom you talk to. If you look at Barack Obama's speeches to the United Nations, he never uses the term sovereignty. When Barack Obama spoke to the United Nations, he knew that every state that showed up as a representative was sovereign. That's how they got in the door in the first place. And so his point was, what are they gonna do with that sovereignty? How are they gonna calculate the national interest and intermediate across these representative states? Donald Trump went to the United Nations and uses the word sovereignty 27 times in his first speech. His point is that they're all sovereign, but he doesn't mean sovereign in the sense that they get to decide what the national interest is. They're all sovereign because they come with a democratic mandate from the people who express it through that one choice, the vote. And he is the uniquely gifted politician who can determine what that mandate is. Now there, I would agree with you completely. When I saw Donald Trump give that speech the first time, I panicked because you cannot negotiate across absolute sovereignties where there's only one privileged individual to determine what the mandate is. So what we need are these intermediate sovereignties. But these intermediate sovereignties are all about trying to figure out what the voters want after the vote's taken place. And this is where I think our democracies are struggling. And I think you're absolutely right. But I wonder if technology could actually help us solve that problem by creating new powerful intermediates. Now here I'm a little bit nervous about the whole idea of NGOs and civil society. Jan, you have a tremendous history in the solidarity movement, so I don't want to disparage civil society, but where I grew up, civil society was a Ku Klux Klan. And, and, and having civil society that's organized that way is rather alarming. Uh, and, and, and it's gotten even worse with NGOs. Where I grew up, NGOs are called political action committees. They're hugely funded with tremendous wealth to do things that are against the interests of the American people. So as much as I believe that there are elements in civil society and there are NGOs that we would want to incorporate into the democratic process, I fear that any rule that we wrote that said we should bring civil society and NGOs into the mix would be abused by those forms of civil society or those non-governmental organizations that dominate American politics today using the same rules to protect corporate free speech, they have perverted the democratic process in ways that I find deeply distressing. So, so I think you're right, we need to find some other intermediate that we need to bring into the mix. Unfortunately, I, I'm not sure cities are gonna be enough, 
and even more unfortunately, I think the other intermediates that we use to solve the problem of the 1970s have been delegitimated. These are non-majoritarian institutions like politically independent central banks, like the European Commission. If you read Peter Mayer, a dear colleague of, of Jan's and a great mentor of mine, um, Peter Mayer characterizes the whole European construct as a non-majoritarian institution. It's a way of lifting complex policy problems out of democratic debate. And that worked for a while, but now people want these non-majoritarian institutions to be more responsive, and I'm not sure how we do that. So again, I end up very much like you do, Jan, but I think, I think we have a way to imagine a solution that would be common to us both, which would be to come up with some kind of intermediary that could take the pressure off of the state by intermediating these conflicting demands, and so allow the constitutional arrangements that we have to work more effectively by channeling only those things into the political process that need to be resolved in a political way. How we design that, I don't know, but these people are much smarter than I am, so I'm hoping they'll figure it out. Yeah, we would like to... <laughs> to react to this robust defense of uh, not the status quo, let's say, but uh, of uh, traditional thinking. No, look, people have different perspectives and, uh, and we have to respect each other perspective. You see, look, I, th the idea that, that democracy was always in crisis, so what is the fast today, is, uh, is correct and false at the same time because this is basically justifications for doing nothing. And, but, but of course, I, I understand that, uh, that we fail to deal with various problems described today through, throughout ages. I, I, I happen to live in, in, in Venice where we had a plague which killed more people than the last one in the Middle Ages. And then there was uh, a, a Spanish plaque uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. We, 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 we handle um, poorly too. So, so of course, it's not like this that 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 this democracy per underperforms more than than in than other forms of government in the past. I, I wouldn't claim that. At the same time, I I, I just. Look, uh, I believe that the role of intellectual is to question status quo rather than uh, say that everything is fine. Yeah. And I think that, that, that and, and Eric doesn't claim this, that not everything is fine because uh, there are things which, which got to be addressed and we fail time and again to address no matter who is in power. That is the problem. Because, of course, I prefer that those in powers are more uh, educated, intelligent, and honest, rather than being thieves, you know, corrupted, and, and, and demagogues, and, and no education. <laughs> of course. But, but I see sometimes people who I truly believe would make the difference, Obama, one of them, and somehow they fail to make the difference. And of course, I prefer o Obama than Trump, but Trump is, a, uh, you can say, in perverse way, a, a child uh, of Obama era. So you see, there is the problem here. Uh, we have to address that, that it's maybe not that our people are not in charge and the others are screwing it around. No, sometimes we s the, the, those who are in, in power are prisoners of, of the institutional arrangements we believe is functioning, and it was functioning for many years, and now is, is not functioned any longer. And here is another thesis, you see. Some people believe that democracy can only be as, as it is. I just reviewed three books, very famous thinkers uh, among them, uh, Stein, Kalun, and Fukuyama. And they all believe that the traditional model of democracy it doesn't have to be a reform. We have to go back to this traditional model. But I'm rather a student of Robert Dahl who said, democracy changed over ages because societies and economy and, and, and technology change. 
it was different in the city state in 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 uh, in, in in Greece then it changed with the, the rights of nations and, and nation states and maybe we need another change how it would be I, I try to speculate but it's easier to talk about the past than the future of course and yet we have to talk about the future not because they stopped inviting us to television stations but because actually uh, we don't want this future to be lost and and I actually feel by working with students of my life that that my generations which was you know, which we thought we did pretty well has left the the future the generations without patience with damaged uh, environment and actually society is more dysfunctional dysfunctional polarized than ever and I live in the 70s there were a lot of problems by then uh, and they were different behind the iron cart and then then the new as you call it free world but <laughs> but you know I, I I believe I couldn't I always believe that things will improve and we get grip on this and I'm losing the the hope for this unless we do something uh, But here we are. I don't want to talk any longer because uh, <laughs> we are getting you know, more and more. I just, I, you know, why I don't want to continue this line because I just passed a Place Sablon, and uh, in front of of the bookshop, there is an advertising books for optimists. <laughs> so <laughs> I realized that I had to target this market. <laughs> I, I'm part of that market. I already see two hands, uh, one, uh, three. Sorry, I start with the last row in the first block behind you, Carol, and then at the very, uh, at the very back of the room. Yeah, uh, my name is Milena Lazarevic. Uh, I come from a think tank, European Policy Center, Belgrade. Um, Thinking about the title of this lecture, The Lost Future and How to Reclaim It, I can't help but think that the future are the young people, the future are children. And um, one reason why I believe that we are in a lot of trouble is because young people are increasingly apathic and alienated from politics. I don't think that we can count on young people contributing to politics anymore through joining political parties. I think we need new instruments on how to involve young people uh, into politics and into the creation of future uh, of the future of democracy and I believe that today we are in a much bigger trouble than uh, in some of the past generations because because of the digitalization and technological progress the generational gaps are increasing I am I have a my older son is, is 13 and I already cannot understand him sometimes I mean I literally need a translator to understand when he speaks about internet games uh, and things that are you know pertinent to his generation so how are we going to and with all due respect I don't think that the future of democracy can only be decided by 60 year olds 50 year olds even 40 year olds to whom I, I, I belong so how do we involve young people what kind of mechanisms can we find to involve young people into politics Ob you mentioned Obama. Obama started the uh, uh, international multilateral uh, initiative called Open Government Partnership, which is a beautiful multilateral initiative in which countries are basically uh, competing on how to open government. Can we dream of an international multilateral initiative uh, where governments will compete on, how, on new innovative ways to involve young people into deciding the future of democracy? Thank you. I must protest. I still have a vote. Uh, and I think my colleagues here also still have a vote. <coughs> Although somebody suggested to me that uh, voting in democracy should be weighted by the future life expectancy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then my vote is going down <laughs> slowly. But for the time being, it's still, uh, as one used to say, one man, one vote. <laughs> Eric is better uh, in, in saying what should be done. But I tell, I tell you, you know, nobody will give you uh, uh, power. You have to take it. That's the principle. Uh, you, you have to take it. 
it's the things don't vested interests are not being changed because uh, 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 some uh, uh, professor or, 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 or public intellectual has a perfect idea how to reorganize societies. No, of course, you can only take it if you have a paradigm how to, to take it and basically make things better. But, but those things never change because those in power were enlightened enough and gave you a present. Those things happen because those who were deprived access to decisions and resources rebelled. But rebellion and se or self-organization in the present internet era is also organized differently than in the past. I see this in Poland where my friends from Solidarity were, were uh, you know, marching uh, on streets for, for I don't know uh, how many cold days to defend constitutions. Then women were protesting against total ban on abortion and they got nothing. Because in the internet era, it doesn't work like 30 years ago. Milena, I, th I think you're asking exactly the right question. And, and the only way I can give you an answer is through case study. Um, and the two case studies uh, I would offer are um, Black Lives Matter in the United States and the Sardines movement that formed in Italy. Um, Black Lives Matter has been wonderful in terms of mobilizing young people. Um, and, and it does so in a very interesting way because there's no obvious named leadership. As a matter of fact, it's the first civil rights movement in the United States that didn't pivot off of an individual leader. And that was an intentional choice because they realized that having an individual leader creates a single point of failure. All they have to do is take out the will collapse around it. So what they did is they built a movement that was intentionally grassroots with no clear leadership structure, and it has remained mobilized far longer than anyone initially expected. The challenge with Black Lives Matter is to take that mobilization and bring it into the political decision-making process. And that's been difficult because the success of Black Lives Matter has so terrified other parts of the American population that they have mobilized against it. And so, so I think you're asking the right question, but, but the answer has to be, we have to do it in such a way that we don't create a countervailing force that pushes the youth back out again, the Sardines Movement. The Sardines Movement was created because Matteo Salvini, the leader of the Lega, uh, came to Bologna, which is the capital of the PD, the Democratic Party. Uh, he, he hosted an event and he claimed that there were thousands of people who attended, right? And each of the 10 people who were there agreed with him. Um, <coughs> the, the, the young people of the city said, this is absurd, right? Um, and so what they did is they said, we're going to organize to show that we can bring many more people than Salvini can. Uh, and they would squeeze into the main square on this raised part of the main square of the city of Bologna that looks like a schiacciata or a flat piece of bread. Um, they, they squeeze as many people on and they squeeze them so tight they called themselves the sardines. And it was a dramatic success. It multiplied across the country. It was a huge wave of mobilization. They got young people in and there were self-consciously apolitical. They said, we're not going to be a party. We're not going to take a stand. We're not right or left. We just hate all of you guys. And we're young people and we're going to be really effective. And they were really effective. It's just they didn't know what to do with the power they seized. And, 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 and unfortunately, since they were all based on flash mobs, when the pandemic struck, which happened only weeks after their great success in determining the outcome of the January 2020 regional elections in Emilia Romagna, um, when the pandemic struck, their movement faded away. So, so the second lesson is not only that we want to have a mobilization that doesn't invoke a countervailing force, but we need to have a mobilization that can be sustained no matter what the geographic or temporal constraints are placed upon it. Those are the only two clues I got for you. There's, there's got to be a way to do it, though, and that's the thing I would underscore. People are inventing ways to bring the youth into politics. What we need to do is to identify them, study them, and then help them to crystallize these things. They are the creative force, but the advantage of having been around a long time is that you have a larger menu of 
options to use as ways of evaluating their success or failure. Hello, Lucas Zanderman, Institute for Global Change. Like, my first, I have two main points, despite the fact that I mostly agree with everything that's been said. The first one is, you know, you're talking about the lost future, but aren't we, you know, isn't, hasn't this year demonstrated that maybe stability is overrated? And in the past 10 years, the political reflection in the West has overhyped stability as opposed to sort of entropic chaotic democracy with its slow pace, but ultimately an organic process that provides higher quality decision making at the end. And secondly, I think in terms of the intermediate bodies, I think these are emerging. I think about the work of the Open Data Institute that's been created by Sir Berners-Lee, the founder of Internet. And for 10 years, they've been doing work on the rise of data institutions. I think of data trust that use trust law as a framework for data governance. And that's, that's an incredibly powerful way to, for example, think about using data politically for good. Or even in the internet, let's think about the vast majority of forums. Let's think about Wikipedia. Like, aren't we sure that, I do think that when we analyze the entire data and internet ecosystem, we're not actually seeing new forms of democracy that already are there. We're just ignoring them. Like political theorists are just ignoring them. Theorists always ignore reality. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a very difficult question. Um, do you want to answer or we take some other? Let's ignore. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I see, okay, now it's getting a bit out of hand. Uh, first of all, <laughs> here in the second row, uh, then I have somebody over there, and then. Uh, we have uh, half a hand here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Melissa Montel Borsbaum, uh, Humanity of Things Agency, Civil Society, uh, Humanity Agent 001, meaning um, I was educated in uh, a different generation. I'm in the 40s, I'm an ex. So, meaning that I think our generation has a huge responsibility. We are the in between generations, we were the ones understanding what was living the, the between ties. So, and we are now reaching uh, understanding of life deeper, and we are also more capable. As I reflect myself with my own intellect, I keep thinking why we do not go back to basis. Why don't we focus on literacy? Literacy, simple literacy. We have children in school and they do not know what it means to be a citizen. Not to have politics ideas or ideologies, but what it means to have rights and obligations, to live in a society, what the basic structures of power means. Democracy literacy, citizenship literacy, power literacy. Why do not focus in literacy? Because we, you keep talking about the sardines. The sardines got together, but they did not know what to do because they do not know the premise of the base of thought. If you want intellect and critical thinking capacity, you need to give toolkits. You teach children years and years and years, and universities, by the way, and you do not go to the basics. I was taught law in the university, so I became a lawyer. But then I think that the great fraud of dem democracy is saying that I cannot invoke that I don't know the law. The state can impose a law. I cannot invoke not knowing, while to be honest, even being a lawyer is not knowing the law because it's such a mess. Politics, what is politics? I do not have a political party still now, I'm 45. I do not wish to become partisan. I want to be independent and I want to participate in democracy as an independent intellectual thinker. Because progress and human progress should have been that we are not being seen as uh, uh, this, this 
population that need this patronizing thought. We should have, evolu the evolution should have been that you as a professor and me as a mere civilian could be humans and have a conversation and my intellect would be enough to interact with your intellect. So my question also for you, being active citizens, is how you see that also academics can take their own power, they can take their own knowledge and intervene in society as civilians, as humans, as agents of our own future and bring all those years and that capacity of life and knowledge. That's my question and to be honest, a call for action of yourselves as well. I will be very brief and it's very much related. I'm Norina Pustika from SAPS. And yes, I, I, I can't get over the fact that when we talk about democracy, we should talk specifically about if we are enabling, enabling citizens to rightly exercise their democratic rights and, 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 and they vote, like being able to vote and that does not necessarily mean that you can actually vote for your, your interests. So uh, I think I would like to hear more about do we actually care and shouldn't we have more of a conversation of distribution of opportunities? And also let's face it, not all young people, the same, some people, some young people are already in the position of becoming the best leaders. So I think also we should have a conversation about the ethics of uh, our leaders in general. Given the average age of this stage, I don't know whether we are well <laughs> qualified to give any answer, but maybe Eric, you're the, you're the guy who <laughs> provides the solution. You're the youngest. So I was, I, I was Daniel's bag carrier for five years, so I'm just, uh, I'm, I, I will always be the youngest on, on the stage. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but the, but the point you make about us descending, it's Melissa, right? Marisa, the point you make about us descending into the stage, I mean, the, the, Jan does this hugely, and I'm speaking for him because, because he's too modest to say so himself, but is very active in, in public conversation in Italy and in engaging with Italian politicians on very complicated issues associated with European integration and, and democracy and all the rest. And, and if you look at his book, you'll notice that unlike any other academic book, it has a cartoon on every other page. Um, with, with the idea precisely as he was admitting to me at the outset of, of saying, you know, I'm going to make a serious argument, but I don't want to be too pompous, right? Um, it, I think, you know, for us to descend into the arena, the arena descend from our ivory towers um, is absolutely vital. I mean, but it's not just vital because we have some brilliant insight to offer. It's vital because we get the most interesting and important research questions from our engagement with non-academics. If I want to bore myself to tears, I'll do research based on what other academics are asking. But, but if I want to have an interesting agenda, then I have to engage with people who are not academics. And, and I think we try to do that. That doesn't, though, mean that, that, that we would ever pretend to have all the answers. I mean, if we, can, if we can begin to identify what's interesting, that's already a huge, huge bonus. Um, and that, that gets to, to, to Duina's point about democracy. Um, and I think the, the, the point you raised, Duina, is, is the one that we find most challenging, right? I mean, we define democracy in terms of free and fair elections and freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, and, and we have certain elements that we put into it. But, but the sort of mechanics of how you engage in a democracy in a way that you feel is legitimate, that, that you feel is representative, that, that reinforces the democratic process in a positive way and binds you to it, that's, that's a magic formula that we've been missing. Uh, and, and you can tell because if you look at the abstention rates, the people who are dropping out of voting, um, that, that, that they're increasing. Even in a country like Italy where 80% of the people, I know you're Italian as well, but 80% of the people uh, used to go out and vote and now that number is declining radically. So I don't know what the solution to that is. And, and in many ways that was the, that was the, the question that Milena asked about, about inventing new forms of engagement and the new forms of engagement to be invented have to be organic, they have to be bottom up because if I invent a form of engagement it, it might attract me. Um, but, but, but hardly anybody else is going to be attracted in the same way. And, and so I think we need to get, get better at that. And, and, and here I'm going to give back to Jan, so I'm sorry I've monopolized this. Um, we should know, though, that there are people who are really talented at inventing f new forms of engagement. 
uh, Donald Trump has got the bread and circuses form of engagement down to an art, uh, and, and he's not alone. And, and those new forms of engagement are, are potentially very dangerous as a consequence because the, the crowd has a mind of its own, if you know what I mean. Was a very patient uh, question over there? Yes, here, yeah. So my, my hand is over here. Yep. Okay, yeah. Yes, very good. So uh, my name is Afonso Ferreira. I'm a researcher with the uh, French CNRS, the Centre National pour la Recherche Scientifique. And I, uh, I would like to come back to the premise uh, that was announced by, by Ian. And I, I want to be sure that Eric didn't actually. Uh, um, throw the baby with the baby's bath when he just dismissed it. Um, so coming for space first, so s many of the problems that were mentioned by Jan actually, they are borderless. And this is an important point. So no nation country can solve them alone. Climate change, pandemic, uh, financial crisis, uh, even the war that is about two nations actually is a matter of uh, imperialism and hegemony or whatever. So it's borderless also. So space is there and I think it's a very important thing. Time. If we look at it from another perspective, uh, we, we, we saw that in some labs uh, today and yesterday. So we are in the second part of the chess. Uh, board. So for the exponential problems, they are all reaching the point where we see them as crisis. And this is a very big difference as well. So we have plenty of things that are exponentially exploding in a visible point, and this is time, actually. And the internet and everything that comes with digital revolution actually make the communication so fast that everything actually comes at once on our whatever democratic leaders and stuff. So I think that I'd like to hear you commenting on, on this point uh, so that we, we keep the time and space premise alive at least a little more. And I'd like to, to, to bring just one point to Jens' point of failures is uh, censorship, censorship in democratic environments that we are witnessing now today in Europe. Thanks a lot. Uh, we are running seriously over time. I have one, is that two questions there? Ah, this one, okay, good, yeah. Um, if the microphone could go there, if you stand up, yeah. That. Thanks, hi everyone, I'll be brief. Um, I'm also some from SEPS, hi, I'm Bertha. I represent the youth. Um, I'm um, and I just wanted to bounce off some of the points that we've been talking about here, also about how to engage youth in democracy. Um, I'm from Hungary. I agree that there is a problem. I agree that there are really big failures, and this is super scary. I'm also in Brussels, so you might have noticed that I'm not exactly in Brussels because I think this is the best place to be. I'm in Brussels because I couldn't find a really good place in Hungary to be. And um, thinking about that, I see a lot of initiatives from young people in, in Hungary, and I see them being ignored, which is really frustrating. And I see this not just in Hungary. Um, but maybe what I want to focus on, as we near the end of Ideas Lab, where we've been talking about things like trust and communication and all of these big things, is to sort of bring that down to the individual level and say that everyone here who is over 40 has probably been in charge of at least you know, one or two young people in their lives. And you have probably failed at least one or two of these young people in your lives in some way. And um, I think one way to get the youth engaged, or at least it would work for me, is uh, to give us opportunities like this, where maybe just make it a little bit easier for young people to stand up and say stuff so we don't have to be the most privileged the most proactive people in order to actually have a voice um, so that we actually feel heard. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, Jan deserves the last word on this one. Well, I, I thought it was terrific what you said. I, it's only, uh, and, and, and we should uh, say to organizers, congratulations because you were able 
to 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 put on table your frustrations, but also your ideas how how to do this. And this is how we, this is exactly how we should do this. And 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 in this way, you regain your voice. And this is the beginning. And this is the beginning. And indeed, uh, this book is largely about time and space, which I consider as metaph metaphysical abstract categories previously. And then I discovered that they have much more to do with the needy, greedy problems which even officials in the city have to struggle with. And therefore, I invite you to go a little bit outside our usual, you know, uh, bubbles <coughs> and, um, and, you know, and things we look at. And maybe we find a way forward. That's it. Okay, uh, that sounds uh, less pessimistic than the lost future. Uh, let's engage on the way forward. Many thanks for having been so late with us. Bye-bye. <laughs>